right. The Beatitudes, Matthew 5, 1 through 12. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who persecute, who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the, crowd, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. This is God's word. Thank you, Leah. Um, welcome this morning. Uh, I know a lot of people are traveling today, so glad to see you traveled this way. Um, we're starting a new series. <clears throat> we're starting a new series. And I'm starting puberty. <laughs> uh, so over the course of the summer, um, weeks that at least the weeks that I'm teaching, and, and there's a, we'll have more people kind of filling in over the summer to kind of um, uh, mix things up a bit. But um, every week that I'm teaching, uh, at least, and maybe a few others, we're going to be looking at the Sermon on the Mount from Jesus, Matthews 5 through 7. And um, it'll take at least the summer, um, if, you're, if you're familiar with the way we go through things here. Um, we're ballparking it. Um, so at least the summer. And um, this is a very familiar or a famous section of Scripture, even if you don't think you know this, this, these passages, these chapters, more than likely as we go through, you'll hear something that you'll recognize, whether it's the golden rule, which is included here, or some other saying that you th maybe you think, oh, yes, I, I have, I've heard this somewhere. Um, it's very famous. It's very popular. Um, but I wanted to go through this section of Scripture because, well, we just finished up. Genesis 1 through 4, if you've been with us. We started that at the beginning of the year, and we took until May for three chapters. So we'll see how far we can do three, or uh, for four chapters, we'll see what we can do with three. Um, but we said early on in that, that series that we were doing that because it seems, it seems like the way people um, view and interpret and, um, and trust or don't trust those first few chapters of, of, of Genesis... That sort of informs oftentimes the way they view and interpret and entrust the, the, the rest of Scripture. There's, there's many foundational bricks laid in those first few chapters. And just how Genesis 1 through 4 informs in many ways how we see the rest of the Bible and how we read the rest of the Bible, I, I believe that how we view and interpret the Sermon on the Mount in many ways informs how we see Jesus, which is pretty important. And I want to attempt to show that this morning a little bit, and we'll look at more as we go through. But this sermon was given on a mount, on an elevated place. And if we were to um, set out together to try to climb a mountain, hike a mountain, um, we would need to plan. We would need to have a planning session, go through kind of where, where we're headed. Uh, roughly speaking, how are we going to get there? We also need to discuss some common pitfalls we're going to have on the, on the hike and where places we need to be extra careful. Um, and, and hopefully, we'd reach the summit together, we'd sit back, have a pipe smoke if you're so inclined, and enjoy the view. And that's, that's the way we would uh, approach that hike. This sermon of Jesus, in many ways, is a mountain in itself. And if we're gonna set out to climb it, to hike it together, um, we need to set up base camp. We need to set up a planning meeting and discuss how we're going to get through this. And in many ways, today will function as our base camp. Um, this will be an introduction to the rest of the series, and I hope um, 
we can see the path we're going to be taking and how we will reach the end together. And we'll need to talk about some common pitfalls, some, ways, some places we want to avoid as we go through. But hopefully we can all reach the end and we can all sit back and we can appreciate the view together. That's, that's my hope. So we need to break down a few things today as we set out to climb this Sermon on the Mount. Uh, first, we're going to break this down into three headings. Go figure. First, the kingdom context. We need to discuss the kingdom context. Second, moral law and blessing. And third, an invitation to follow. Okay, we got a long hike ahead of us, so let's, let's get to work. Um, the kingdom context. Let's read verses 1 through 12 of chapter 5 one more time. Seeing the crowds, he went up on a mountain. He sat, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying... Uh, by the way, the them, it doesn't really say if it's the disciples or the crowds or both the disciples and the crowds. We'll talk more about that later, maybe next week. But. So he taught somebody there with him, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they are called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you, and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So these blessings set the course. They are the foundation for the next three chapters. Um, and I believe that they're meant to help us frame and support everything else that he's about to say. Because you'll see these themes repeated. And I think we're meant to see, to understand, the whole sermon through the lens of these blessings. So how do we understand the blessings themselves? Um, we'll come back to them next week, so again, we're taking our time. It's a long walk. Uh, but this week, we need to see, in some ways, what they are, or at least how they would have been heard by the people listening to them. Um, so, simply put, um, this is a wisdom poem. It's structured as a poem um, about the people of the kingdom of God, or the kingdom of heaven. And a wisdom poem, in many ways, it's structured like the wisdom literature of the Old Testament, but more specifically, it seems to be structured like the wisdom literature of the Second Temple period. Meaning, for these people, um, th th this is about the kind of person that's a part of God's kingdom, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. That's the bookends of the Beatitudes. And then you have this additional blessing at the end discussing whose reward is great in that kingdom. This is not nine different kinds of people we're talking about. These are all qualities and characteristics of the people who are in the kingdom of heaven. These are all characteristics of one group of people, kingdom people. And if we look back into chapter 4, we can see Jesus' ministry begin. This is uh, the very first words he says in Matthew, chapter 4, verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, or the kingdom of heaven has come near, depending on your translation. And then he calls a few disciples, not all of them, not the full 12 yet. Um, that doesn't happen until chapter 10, but... There's a few called at the end of chapter 4, and then this is the very end of chapter 4. And he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those who were oppressed by demons, those having seizures, paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee to Decapolis and from Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. And then we have chapter 5. Seeing the crowds, he went up on a mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. So 
the context of the Gospel of Matthew so far is the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven has come. And then chapter 5, Jesus sits down and begins teaching his disciples and or the crowds what that means. And everything that follows in the sermon is either a description of those who are in the kingdom or those who are not. And we'll come back to this idea of the sermon as being descriptive in just a minute. First, what does it mean that the kingdom of heaven is near or at hand? What's, what's he kind of insinuating here? When the Bible says the kingdom of heaven is here or at hand, it means simply what we sang about a little bit ago, that the king is here. The king has arrived. Jesus is here. And when he gets enthroned, the new king will bring with him a new kingdom, mean, meaning he will bring with him a, a new way. Um, it, it, when, 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 this is the way it always goes. When you get a new leader in anything, and there's a new set of priorities and a new way of doing things come with them. Whether it's a, a coach on a sports team or a, a new CEO at a business or just you're working at a department store and you get a new manager. It's different. Things change. Because the leader brings his or her priorities and, 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 and values with them. Same, same thing here. Every kingdom produces a certain kind of person who lives within it. Um, and this sermon gives us a description of the kind of person produced by the kingdom of God. And the people listening to Jesus, I think, would have recognized, back to that idea of poetry, the way he's describing these kingdom people. He's giving them something they're familiar with, but he's changing some things. As we said, it's more reminiscent of Second Temple wisdom literature. Jesus is saying there was, you know, there, there's a way to view who is blessed and who isn't, but it's different than the way you think. See, there was this collection of writings, you may know this, you may not, between the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, and the beginning of the New Testament. There's a few hundred years there, and people wrote. People kept writing about God and, and meditating on God. And one of the writings that came out of that was some wisdom literature called the Wisdom of Ben Sira. Anybody heard of the Wisdom of Ben Sira? Okay, there was a free coffee mug in it if you did, but that's, that's okay. Um, but the Wisdom of Ben Sira was just a little bit before Jesus, 100, 200 years or so. Um, a very common wisdom book for the people at the Second Temple period. This is from Ben Sira 25, verses 7 through 10. And it may sound a little familiar. I can think of nine whom I would call blessed, and a tenth my tongue proclaims. A man who can rejoice in his children. Sounds nice. A man who lives to see the downfall of his foes. Hmm, that's different. A man who lives with a sensible wife. Okay, all right. I'll give you that. The one who does not plow with ox and ass together. If I had a dollar, I tell you what. Blessed is the one who does not sin with the tongue. And the one who has not served an inferior. Huh. Blessed is the one who finds a friend. It sounds nice. And the one who speaks to attentive listeners. Hmm. How great is the one who finds wisdom, but none is superior to the one who fears the Lord. There's some good things in there. Um, but this is probably a good representation of what we would call the common wisdom at the time of Jesus. This, is, this was a part of their, what, the kind of the, the, the cultural understanding of what it means to be blessed. You are blessed if these things are true for you. And why the people are so astonished at the end of chapter 7 is because over and over and over again throughout this sermon, in, beginning with these Beatitudes, Jesus takes something that they already have a concept for, and he flips it. And in doing so, you know, he says, this is what you thought, but actually, and in doing so, he speaks with an authority. He speaks against the way their Second Temple Jewish culture views it. He speaks in a way that is unusual from their scribes and teachers. He speaks with an authority over the understanding of their culture. They all said... They all agree that you're blessed if your enemies fall. You are blessed if you don't have to serve anybody. You're blessed if people listen to you when you speak. 
basically you're not poor and people think that you're important. But Jesus says God's kingdom, in God's kingdom, blessed are those who are poor. And blessed are the people, not just who people listen to, but blessed are the people who are hurt by others to make them shut up. And also the enemies and the people that persecute you. In God's eyes, considering if you're going to be considered as his children, chapter 5, verse uh, 44 says, you don't, you don't see their downfall. You don't, you don't, the children of God love their enemies and bless those who persecute. Jesus is giving a vision for the kingdom person True, but he's also speaking directly into their cultural misunderstandings of what it means to be blessed and what it means to be actually with God on some of these things. See, in the life of the people of God's kingdom, there is a reversal of values. There's a reversal of priorities that the world will tend to drift to naturally because there's a reversal of perspective. The kingdom people will view what the world calls worthless as not only not worthless, but redeemed. And they're not swept up by what the world says actually has ultimate value. And here, here's what I mean by that. There's a wonderful book called The Divine Conspiracy by Dallas Willard. It's mostly about the Sermon on the Mount and what it means to live in the kingdom. And commentating on these things, at the very beginning of the book, he says something. He talks about the kingdom of God as like flying upside down. We've talked about this, I think, before. I, I know we have. <laughs> but he tells a story at the beginning of, of his book about a pilot. And they get caught in a storm, and, and their instruments aren't working right. And so they begin to make these movements based on what they think or where they think they are in the sky. But they don't realize, because of the clouds and the malfunctioning of the instrument panel, they're actually flying upside down. And so as they make movements upward, in reality, they're going down. And as they make movements down, in reality, they're actually gaining elevation. And so the pilot eventually crashes, trying to gain altitude. They crash into the ground. And Jesus, in many ways, is doing something very similar in the sermon. He's saying the way you think you raise up is actually tearing you down. And the way that you think is going to bring you down actually will be the vehicle for which God brings you up and blesses you. The kingdom of heaven, those who get in to the rest of the world will look like they're flying upside down, but actually they're flying right side up while the kingdom of the world is flying upside down. Because when we're not living with the kingdom focus, everything we think is causing us to lose altitude in life is actually the things that God uses to lift us. And at the same time, what we think is giving us life is actually things that are driving us to the ground. But in the kingdom of God, the value systems are reversed. We see the way up is going to look like the way down to the rest of the world. And the rest of this sermon, the rest of these three chapters, is a continual attempt to show you thought it was this way. You've been taught it was this way. You, you, you've, you've seen it done by people you thought were on the way up. They lived like this. But the path that your teachers and your scribes are showing you will that that they say it leads to life, but it actually leads to death. And the path that truly leads to life is going to look like death to the rest of the world. And, and, and it all begins by taking some common structure of wisdom literature that for them, a blessing poem, they understand what he's doing. But then he starts putting in these people. These people aren't supposed to be blessed. This isn't what blessing looks like. But he's showing that the true wisdom of God is going to look like foolishness to the rest of the world. Let's, let's move on. Moral law and blessing. Look at chapter 5, verse 1 through 3. Seeing the crowds, he went up on a mountain. And when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Okay, there's a couple other areas we probably want to hash out before we start hiking this mountain together. And that's the issues of law and blessing. Because um, so much of what Jesus talks about over the next three chapters uh, is, an ex is an expansion or a clarification on um, uh, how these folks, and therefore how all folk folks going forward, 
should understand the law, or specifically by law, I mean God's moral standards that he laid out with Moses. And, is, and, and, and it, is most, it is really the moral law that Jesus is dealing with, the moral law of God, not ceremonial laws, not clean laws, not judicial laws. It's God's moral law of how to relate, how to love, and how to live. And Jesus says he doesn't come to abolish this law. In, 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 in chapter 5, verse 17, he comes to fulfill it, and he doesn't relax any of these moral commandments, and he says that other people shouldn't either. If anything, the clarity that he brings to these commandments in this moral law uh, uh, places the importance of them at a heart level and even at the level of thought, not just behavior. And so, it, if anything, it intensifies the moral law of God. So we should probably deal with how to view the moral law as we proceed, um, or at least what he's doing with the law, because there's, there's some thoughts about that. Uh, but we also have to deal with the idea of being blessed. Um, and I guess we should do that first because Jesus starts with blessing and then he moves to law. Um, but I don't think we're going to do that. Because, um, for me anyway, um, I, I have been confused about how Jesus talks about the law and what he's doing with these moral commandments. And I think, for me, that has misinformed the way I understand the blessing. So what I want to do is, is look at the moral laws in just a, at first and how Jesus is talking about them and understand that there's kind of two main approaches to these things. Um, how, and, and, and I want to look at that and, how, and see how we view Jesus in many ways informs which way we lean on how to view the morality that he's discussing. Or r rather, we could say, how we view the morality informs how we view Jesus. It can go either way, I suppose. But this is what I mean by saying how we approach this sermon often informs how we approach Jesus. At least 11 times over the course of these three chapters, Jesus says, you've heard it taught, or you've seen people do this, or the hypocrites do it this way. Right? But I want you to know, in reality, this is how it is. This is what you should do. This is how you pray. This is how you treat people. This is how you relate to the world around you. And so there's two main camps on how to view these moral commands and moral clarifications that Jesus is making. And my goodness, if this is not hotly debated, um, I made the mistake this week of reading some commentaries. And that's usually not a bad idea, but it's amazing how hotly people uh, uh, condemn the other way and saying the point of the Sermon on the Mount or the point of the moral commandments is this. And it's the exact opposite of the last book I just read. And then you go to another one and they're back to the first book and they, they're, they're knocking down the other person, even mentioning people by name, you know. Um, and like, well, I just read that other book just a minute ago and it sounded fine. Um, <laughs> a lot of back and forth. So I, I want to, and I, and I realize there's something here that, that when I return back to um, Dallas Willard and, and Dietrich Bonhoeffer and these people who also talk about this Sermon on the Mount, that there is another way to view it. But I want to look at the two extremes because I think these are really common and, and, and I want us to avoid some of these pitfalls. On one side, some people see Jesus describing an ethical uh, prescription. He's, he's giving a, an ethical prescription that we should follow. And if we do what he says, not only will we be blessed and be a part of his kingdom, but we're actually going to, in many ways, uh, bring about the reality of the kingdom in the world around us. Um, Jesus, from this position, and there's a lot of truth in this, but Jesus is the new Moses. And just like Moses went up on a mountain and brought down God's moral law for the people to follow, Jesus is here in Matthew 5 going up on a mountain, and he's giving people the law of the new covenant. And those who do what he says will be in. And you can look at chapter 7, verse 24, and it says, Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. So read these chapters, live your life by them. Seems pretty simple. Several years ago, um, I, I think I've shared this story before, but several years ago I, I, was, I had a coworker who was an atheist or an ag agnostic, depending on you know, the mood you caught him in. But uh, one day he had came back from vacation. And I, and I asked him, um, his name is Eric. I said, Eric, what did you do on vacation? Uh, and he said, uh, well, I decided to, sp to spend my vacation reading through the New Testament. 
Um, and I, not wanting to give away the fact that I've never even dreamed of spending a vacation just reading the New Testament, um, asked my atheist friend that Bible study question, well, so uh, what stuck out to you? And uh, he said, he said the Sermon on the Mount, which I realize is only five chapters into the New Testament, so he may have checked out halfway through, I don't know. But anyway, he said the Sermon on the Mount. And he said, it is the most ethical prescription for living I've ever seen. And he said it encapsulates all major ethical theories, which is true, by the way. It does. If you take the, like the three major ethical theories and you lay them over the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is the only um, moralist, I guess you could say, in history to bring together all major ethical theory into one way of living. And my friend noticed that. It's like, this is incredible. It's different, but yet familiar. This is everything. Um, but then he said something that I'll, I'll, I don't think I'll forget. He said, you know, he said, if the whole world just lived the way Jesus said to live, this world would be a perfect place. And he's right, I suppose. I mean, except for like tsunamis and COVID, you know, uh, regarding relationships anyway, how we treat people in the middle of tsunamis and COVID, I suppose, um, how we exist with each other. There wouldn't be any more wars. There wouldn't be any people in need. Everyone would, would be loved and cared for. We, we'd all be free of anxiety and so many mental health issues and, 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 and a million other things that plague us every day. This wouldn't be a problem if everybody in the world lived the way Jesus says to live. So he's, he was right, in a sense. This world would be about as perfect as we could make it. And so this leads many to assume, well, that's the point Jesus is making. To provide the world with a new, perfect moral ethic and law. So perfect that they would then be perfect as their father is perfect. That's verse 48 of chapter 5. And then that would make the world around them as perfect of a place to live as possible and therefore usher in the realities of the kingdom of God and bring those priorities into reality by living out the prescription of Jesus' new ethic and law. And there's a lot there that's true. There's a lot of things you can find that, yeah, that makes sense. Three chapters are, these three chapters are objectively a better way to live and love and relate to the world around us. No question. But then there's another side. And they say, well, hold on a second. I don't know if you've noticed, but no one lives this way. Nobody, not all the time. And this then has led another group to say, let me tell you what the point of the Sermon on the Mount really is. It's not an ethical prescription that we're expected to follow because we can't. There is a moral perfection that God demands, and that's what Jesus is laying out, but we can never reach that moral perfection. So the point of Jesus' sermon is to show the unattainable. By showing us what we should be but will never be, Jesus is showing us all the various reasons why we need him. And so this sermon Jesus is giving is a way of showing people how they should live. And if they did it, they would bring about the reality of the kingdom. But he's really showing them a way that they can't live. And thereby saying in a different way, you need to be saved from your moral failures. Now, I think personally, uh, then there's truth in both of those things, clearly. But I think that there is, that's a couple of pitfalls. If you go off on either side of that horse, um, I think we should avoid that as we climb this mountain together. Because leaning one way or the other, uh, from what I can see as you lean into the people who are postulating the different ideas, you realize that, there's, um, that it seems almost symptomatic of the way they view Jesus. By that I mean either more human than God or more God than human. Here, here, here's what I mean. Those that tend to see Jesus as humanity the most, Jesus as human, think like liberal mainline churches. They tend to see Jesus as teaching from the ground. And therefore, this is what we all must do from the ground here on earth. Therefore, this is seen as an ethic to follow. But 
However, those that hold Jesus' divinity and supremacy really high, think like conservative reform churches, um, they tend to see Jesus as giving an ethic and a moral standard from above, not from the ground. It's above people. It's beyond us. It's really unattainable. Therefore, this unattainable standard shows us what we should be but can't and will never be enough. And so what Jesus is actually doing is showing us why we need him. But I think to see what Jesus is actually doing here, we need to take a look at the idea of what it means to be blessed. It's a really important word in the Bible. So just, just pin that whole ethic, prescription, or unattainable uh, morality just for a second. Keep that, keep that in your mind. And let's talk about blessing for a second. Huge word in the Bible. We can have a whole sermon just on what it means to be blessed. Maybe someday, not today. But bless are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. If you go to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6, you, you see a very similar section of Scripture. Jesus is going through this there as well. In Luke 6, 20, he says, Blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Um, and, and people often wonder, uh, uh, is it the poor who are blessed, or is it the poor in spirit who are blessed? Um, and so just, just, for, just to kind of address that for a second, um, I think one of the things we're going to have to do over and over and over again throughout the sermon is shake loose our Western compartmentalization of those things and realize that for these folks, being poor and being spiritually poor was not different. Because it's only really because of the teachings of Jesus that we're able to compartmentalize and see that you can be rich and spiritually poor or poor and spiritually rich. It's because of the teachings of Jesus where we even have categories for those things. Most cultures, if you're poor, you're spiritually poor. You're not blessed. But if you're rich, you're blessed. And our culture in many ways is slipping in that direction too. Here's a list of some recent tweets. I just did a quick search um, of what it means to be blessed according to our culture today. Uh, they're not on the screen, so just listen carefully. Just cashed out my second Beamer at the age of 22. Hashtag blessed. Got the win by technical knockout. Now 3-0 and with three knockouts. Hashtag blessed. The second shot is on my arm. Hashtag blessed. Five generations of family are gathered for Mother's Day. Hashtag blessed. I'm just loving this bikini. Hashtag blessed. <laughs> the point is, is, whether they're good things or not, we can often associate what it means to be blessed with certain benefits. And it's the exact same way with these people Jesus is speaking to. They were blessed, remember, if they didn't have to serve anybody, if their enemies fell, if they were respected and listened to by other people. Hashtag blessed. Jesus is saying, the poor are blessed, the oppressed, those who mourn, the peacemakers, not the enemy crushers. And the only way we can understand what Jesus is doing with the moral law of God is also see what he's doing with the blessings. And here's what I mean. Throughout the Bible, there is a couple things that are associated with being blessed that isn't actually what being blessed is, but rather effects of it or attributes around it. For instance, take Psalm 1, verses 1 through 2. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits at the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and he, he, on his law he meditates day and night. So it's very tempting to then say, to read this and say, okay, being blessed is doing these things, and assume that what it means to be blessed is not being a jerk and loving God's word. That's kind of what it sounds like, but it's, it's not actually what it says. On the other side, uh, we take the effects of blessings and say that's what blessing means. Like Proverbs 10, 22, it is the blessing of the Lord that makes rich. So the temptation is to find being blessed as what we do or what we get. And what Jesus does by saying this group in the Beatitudes are blessed is remove either option. And what he does is he puts the idea of being blessed back into its true definition. See, Psalm 1, the person who's doing this stuff is blessed. Being blessed isn't doing this stuff. 
Proverbs 10, God's blessing can make you rich, but being rich isn't the same as God's blessing. God's blessing throughout Scripture ultimately always is God himself being with him, being brought into a relationship with him. Remember the context of the Beatitudes, the arrival of the kingdom. The poor now have available to them all of the resources of God in his reign and in his rule. Of course, the rich can, can be blessed too, but the blessedness is not in their possessions, just like the blessedness of the poor isn't there because of their lack of possessions. Either way, Jesus is showing, helping them to see, being blessed isn't what you think. It's always been about God and being with him, always. Jesus isn't saying that poverty, physical or spiritual, is the cause of the reason they are blessed and therefore not creating another rule, like if you want to be blessed, you've got to get poor. But Jesus is showing that these things that are held in their common wisdom as unblessable, an unblessed condition, is in actuality just as capable, if not more so, God will decide what it means to be blessed. And, that he, and what he will do with his blessing within his kingdom. You can see this list of attributes. It describes the kingdom person. These are the people God's going to bless. They're not unblessable. Because blessing isn't what you do or what you get. It's being with God in his kingdom. That's what it means. So the poor in spirit are blessed. And then if we turn and pivot to the rest of the moral teaching and use those, that frame of the Beatitudes as our guiding light, we can see that these three chapters that follow are not so much, they're not prescribing an ethic that we should do, a standard we should live by, and they're not giving us a standard that we will never achieve, the reason we need Jesus. Rather, from the Beatitudes forward, they are describing for us what people look like who are with God in his kingdom. It's a description of those who are truly blessed. It's a description of kingdom people. The very next section, verse 5, 13, you are the salt of the earth, 14, you are the light of the world. This is a quote from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He said this, you are the salt. Jesus does not say you must be the salt. It is not for the disciple to decide whether they will be salt of the earth, for they are so whether they like it or not. They, may, they have been made salt by the call they received. Again, it is not you are the salt, not, or it is you are the salt, not you have the salt. The word speaks of their whole existence insofar as it is grounded anew in the call of Christ. That same existence which was the burden of the Beatitudes. The call of Christ to make those who respond to it the salt of the earth in their total existence. Let's move on to the next section, an invitation to follow. Chapter 7. And when Jesus had finished these things, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority, not as their scribes. He was turning the tables and what they had been taught. In many ways, the Sermon on the Mount is not an ethic to follow. Rather, it is an invitation to follow Jesus and see him as more than just another teacher. It's also not a standard that we can't attain. It is a description of who we will be in the kingdom of God. It is not a list to what, of what to do to be blessed, or a list of what you get that makes you blessed. Jesus is declaring that the kingdom of heaven is here, and he's describing the people who are going to be with God in that kingdom. And the next three chapters, he goes on to describe what the people of God's kingdom look like compared to the people who are living in the kingdom of the world. Jesus is describing the upside-down life and how it differs from the so-called wisdom of the world. And everything that you've been taught, that you thought you knew, that this was the way to get ahead in life, no, that will bring you down. The way to get ahead in life is loving your enemies, not waiting and hoping for their downfall. It seems to me that the Sermon on the Mount is not a prescription to follow because 
like the other side says, we can't just go do it on our own. But rather, it's a description of who we will be if we are in the kingdom. We will live like this. We will be this. This will be a description of you and me. These beatitudes will be attributes of us. We don't become the attributes so we can get blessed. We are made this way by his kingdom, and if you don't find yourself living this way, if you don't find yourself uh, described in these three chapters, we're not called to then on the other side abandon all effort and say, well, that's just why I need Jesus. I can't do this anyway. Bonhoeffer called that cheap grace. We also can't swing to the other side and say, if I'm not in these chapters, if I don't find myself here, I need to try harder to live up to these standards because that's what puts me in the kingdom. Rather, if we don't see ourselves in the description of those who are blessed and we don't see ourselves relating like those who are blessed in his kingdom, chapters 5 through 7, the call, the invitation is to follow Jesus into his kingdom, ask for the blessing, ask for the entrance into his presence. This is the invitation, Matthew 7. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. Everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds and the one who knocks, it will be opened. It's not about trying harder to do this and it's not about saying, I can't make it, that's why I need Jesus. This is who you will be if you see him and you are walking with him in his kingdom and you're following him. And if you don't see yourself here, if you don't see yourself in these descriptions of what it means to live and love and relate, ask. Ask for the blessing. Ask to be brought into the kingdom. Knock. The door to the kingdom is open. But no. The blessing is not found in either approach, not in trying harder or giving up. The blessing is found in the pursuit of God in seeking him and finding him, seeing him for who he is. And if we're looking at him, if, this is, if we're looking at him, this is what our life will look like. And if it's not what our lives look like, let's seek him. Let's seek first his kingdom, and everything else gets added. Because if we look at these pieces, the, just, just take a look at the Beatitudes for a minute. Those, each one of those things, those attributes, we can see, and we'll talk about this more next week, it's not, a, it's not different people. It's not you got some peacemakers, and you got some people who mourn, and you got some people who are hungering and thirsting for righteousness. This is, it's creating a mosaic of qualities and attributes that show us the kingdom person. If you put these things together, it doesn't make a bunch of different groups. It makes one kingdom person. Blessed are the poor in spirit, those who mourn, the meek, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely. This is one person the kingdom person. And this is not who you should attempt to be, but rather this is who you are and who you will be if you're moving into the kingdom of God. But we also know we can only be like this if we're following Jesus, the disciple that comes to him when he sits down at the beginning of chapter 5, sits at his feet with him, follows him, That's the other big umbrella context of this sermon, coming to Jesus. Because before this list ever describes me or you or any of us, we have to see, ultimately, this is describing Jesus. These Beatitudes, the image that is created by this mosaic, collectively, when we put them together, yes, by God's grace, it does look like the kingdom person. It, it will look like you and like me, but only because the, by the grace of God we are being conformed into the image of his son. Because this is what Jesus looks like. Poor in spirit, mourns, meek, 
hunger and thirsting for righteousness, merciful, pure in heart, peacemaking, persecuted for righteousness sake, reviled and persecuted and uttered all kinds of evil against him falsely. This is Jesus. And this is who, by the grace of God, we are being conformed into the image of because we together, yes, if we're in the kingdom collectively, we make up that mosaic of that kingdom person, but and more on that in the coming weeks. But in the meantime, just feel the freedom of the Sermon on the Mount, that it's not an ethic you have to follow, and it's not a burden that constantly tells you you're not measuring up. But it's, it's a vision of who you are if you're looking into the face of God. As the old hymn says, O oh, soul, all you wearied and troubled, no light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. Through death into life everlasting, he passed and we follow him there. Over us, sin no more has dominion for more than conquerors we are. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this um, freeing sermon. We, we, we thank you that it is three chapters of who we will be, um, not just a burden that crushes us, but a vision of what we look like as we move from one degree of glory to the next, being conformed by your grace into the image of your Son, I ask that you work all things in our life toward that good. As we come to the table this morning, we remember Jesus and what he has done. In the way that he, he became the firstborn of all the new creation, and the firstborn of many brothers. We ask that you just give us a deeper vision of who he is and how you are changing us to make us more like him. And it's in his name we pray, amen. This morning we're gonna take communion. I invite you to come forward and, and, and take the elements we will take together before we respond in worship. Um, as we, as we come to the table and just, and just remember, I, I invite in this moment, you just look at Jesus. Turn your eyes toward him. See him. See him modeling what love looks like in his body and in his blood. And may we be conformed to who he is, even as we take these elements together. Please come and take.